Hello, Carolyn Miss. Hello. It's good to have you. Thank you for accepting this interview. Um, you're definitely one of the greatest mystics of all times, I believe. Well, I don't know about that, but thank you for saying that. And uh, you wrote many, many bestsellers, including At Anatomy of a Spirit. Um, and one of the books that today we want to discuss with you is Defy Gravity, okay. uh, Healing Beyond the Bounds of Reason. Yes. So, so, t so tell us about this love affair that we have with reason. You're telling us that at some point we went out of the soul in our mind, and since then we're not fully living this, um, this experience. Well, I, I think that that goes all the way back to, um, as I like to teach my students, that goes all the way back to, I think, the Renaissance, when the age of enlightenment, the age of reason, when we fell in love with the idea that we could reason with everything. We could reason with that the universe was a reasonable place, a place where uh, God was a reasonable force, where there could be a reason for everything. And that was a very delicious idea. And it challenged what was then a very superstitious universe. You know, a universe that was run by, um, uh, a superstitious so uh, church and fears that were so based on threats of the soul and threats of hell. Mm -hmm. And so when, you know, you have people like Copernicus and Galileo, and, and it, it's really necessary to go back then because it's extraordinary to understand that who we are today actually comes from then. When people like Galileo and Copernicus and where they realized that the earth revolved around the sun and such a simple idea today really was mind boggling to the, to them because they saw an order to the universe and that order became the order of God. And that gave birth to this notion that order and reason were married to each other. And look at the way we talk. When something happens, something we don't understand, we automatically say, God must have a reason. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Right? And that comes from that. That's rooted in that. When a person develops a disease, when a catastrophe happens in your life, uh -huh. we say, I wonder what God's thinking. There must be a reason for this. Why it happened, yeah. Why it happens. And we think that it's reasonable. We think that if we could figure out the reason, there must we talk about there must be a lesson. Mm -hmm. As if we're in this great big huge school, mm -hmm. and if there's a lesson and we can figure that out, then somehow we're going to be rewarded, and that reward will look like this. We will be given back the life we had before the catastrophe happened. And that's actually what we think. And that's applied to healing. That as soon as we figure out what the reason is, that somehow we will be given back our health, we'll be given back our marriage, we'll be given back our job. And there's no truth to this. But our therapy is based on this. Mm -hmm. And so therapy is based on finding the reason. We have to find the reason why. So we go back in this kind of, search and destroy mission to into our past. Did you find the reason yet? No, but I'll keep going back. Did you find the reason back? So that we've aimed our healing in these endless quests into our history. Mm -hmm. So our so our thoughts became really then dense and very serious, I, I hear. Well, yeah, well, well, they became historically focused on looking for something that doesn't exist, which is one reason, one for why our whole life falls apart. One reason for why we're ill. One reason for why whole big things happen to us. And if we find that one single reason, then everything comes together again. Mm -hmm. So the whole thesis itself, the whole thesis is fundamentally preposterous. And that's what I realized when I look at why people are not healing, why, why this, the whole love affair we have with reason is fundamentally preposterous mm -hmm. when you apply it to healing. It doesn't work. 
the, the therapeutic methods are set up are not appropriate at all. They're insufficient. Let's just say they're in they're 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 based on what I feel is um, an idea that is fundamentally erroneous. It, it's not it's 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 based on what we wish which was true, but it's not. We wish it was that simple, but it's not. It's just not. There's no such thing as one reason why anything happens to start with. And number two is you can't reason with an illness. It's not a reasonable experience. You can't reason your way through chaos. You can't reason your way through a catastrophe. And w what makes something happen, come together in your life, is not that you... Um, it's not sourced in one thing that you did or that your mother didn't love you enough or that is so ridiculous. But that is how we've kind of organized therapy. That's how we've organized that it's one negative attitude, mm -hmm. that it's one type of stress that's the root at why a woman has breast cancer. It must be that she just has a broken heart and... That none of this is accurate. None of it. Mm -hmm. But even the spiritual people have a reason, find their spiritual reason for this. Right. And it's not. I mean, you, if you look at your life, just look at your life outside of this model. And you think who you are today is the result of hundreds of choices and hundreds of cycles you've set in motion. Hundreds of them. Hundreds of books you've read hundreds of decisions you've made. And if someone said, "What's give me the one reason you are who you are today. Let's take it outside of the paradigm of chaos and said, what's the one reason you are who you are today? You couldn't answer that question because there isn't one reason you are who you are. There are many cycles, many, and you would realize if I just asked you that, because I'm asking you not because you're in chaos, I'm just asking you that you'd realize how ridiculous that question is. It doesn't make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, 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 can't, it, can't, it can't hold itself. And when I looked at that, I realized if our approach to healing was valid, a lot more people would be healing. When in fact, it's an insufficient approach. And it's time that we... A pra that we took an appraisal of it, that we evaluated it, and we moved beyond reason. So that how, do you, how do you define healing, just so that we're clear on your definition of healing? Well, to me, healing is not just going after an illness and thinking, I have to heal this illness and then I'm well. Mm -hmm. Healing is a experience of transforming a whole relationship to life, a relationship to how a person understands values and one's life and uh, what a person, how a person um, uh, sees their life purpose. It's, a, it's an entire paradigm that one lives within. Um, and I, number two is I don't think we ever stop healing. Because we'll always have something that is confronting us. We'll always have something to deal with. We'll always have, we'll always be facing something. Every morning we get up, we're facing something. But I took a look at the micro level of suffering, of what really compels a person towards suffering. And this is a level that our therapeutic world does not touch. And this is the level that um, one has to cross a bridge into the territory of the mystics to understand. Because within the mystical realm, mm -hmm. within the dark night of the soul, and this is where I, why I, I uh, titled my book Defy Gravity. Because what I meant by that was that the mystic's journey is a journey through the narrow gate mm -hmm. of the soul, 
the narrow gate of the heart, the narrow gate of the soul. Gravity is a, is a word that Newton uh, chose the word gravity, gravis meaning serious, to give weight to. And the issues of our life, that weigh upon us, we give weight to. They burden us. They make us heavy, psychically, emotionally heavy. And eventually, that weight becomes the weight of disease. In the mystical path, that that path is a path of becoming weightless, Mm -hmm. of understanding what is, in the language of Buddha, illusion, from what is truth. You can't do that through the mind. That is a journey. You have to go through that narrow gate and into what Teresa of Avila would call the journey of self-knowledge. Now, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. In the therapeutic world, one a person spends a great deal of time identifying where they've been hurt. Agreed? Mm -hmm. This person hurt me. This hurt me. These are my... And my experience has been that while that is an essential level, an essential stage of healing, no doubt that we could call the witness stage. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to have a stage of the witness where a person's pain is... Uh, validated by another person. And yet, we've stopped there at the validation stage. Mm -hmm. Where the suffering really begins, however, is not that someone hurt you. It's that you want to hurt them back. Your real suffering is at the next stage, the deeper stage, And that's that suffering has caused you to want to return it, to want to return pain. And in our culture, we've placed suffering in such a place that we allow people that. We say your suffering gives you a right to do that. It gives you privilege. And thus, people are not inclined to do exactly what healing requires, which is to forgive. What a person has to do is enter into a a really profound stage of self-examination that begins with looking at um, self-knowledge, which says, you know, you're right. I really, really think a lot about hurting others who've hurt me. I do. I really think about those who humiliated me, I imagine humiliating them. A person has to own that. A person has to recognize that when, for example, all the years that I've taught sacred contracts, which is based on this idea that we have reason, a reason, a sacred reason for our life, which is true, which is true. But when I teach that, so often people think that sacred reason is a very glamorous occupation. But my sacred contract, is that a beautiful job, a glamorous occupation? And they want it to be that because what they fantasize about is having a glamorous occupation so they could show off in front of people who once humiliated them. That that's their fantasy, that they could have a, a wonderful job so that they could be somewhat something that they could, it could fulfill an emptiness and self-esteem. And that that is a means to an end, that their, their absence of self-esteem mm-hmm. is due to the fact that they had once been humiliated or their fear of being humiliated. Are you, are you following this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that their, the way, so long as a person fears being humiliated, that person is always prepared prepared to hurt someone before they're prepared to embrace and trust someone. Mm -hmm. And so the journey that I'm talking about is a journey of looking at that part of yourself. That's a very, that's called the journey of 
of self-illumination to bring light to that level of your shadow. And that's the journey of the inner light. To, and that's the journey that defies gravity because that's the one that doesn't is the most unreasonable journey you'll ever take. It shatters your reason. Mm-hmm. Okay? Because your, your reason, it's not reasonable to go that route is what I'm trying to say. Reason will say, for example, it's someone else's fault. Don't go this route. Never, ever tamper with your fear of being humiliated to become a humble person. Because reason will say that becoming humble means to become poor. Reason does not understand that you can have all the money in the world and still be humble. That to be humble means that no one scares you anymore. That nothing in the outside world scares you. That you are, you are the sort of person that can walk among kings and never ever fear that they will steal your soul. Okay? Mm -hmm. That is power. And that's what a mystic understood. That is what it means to defy gravity. Mm -hmm. To have more light than weight in your soul. Those are the people that understand how to heal. That is healing. So practically, in, a, in practical terms, what are the things that we can do or what are some of the exercises that we can take on in our life towards that? It's a deep and profound exercise. You start with going into um, self-knowledge. The journey of self-knowledge is not a mental exercise. It's a soul one where you take on uh, questions of reflection. And for example, let's say you spend a month looking at observing yourself and you reflect upon what are my fears of being humiliated and how does that control me? How does that control the distance between my intuitive guidance and what actually I act on? And how many times a person gets intuitive guidance but they don't act on it because they're afraid of being humiliated. They're afraid of, what will someone else say? What, what, what will they say if I do this? What will they say if, they, if I really followed the slightest, the slightest intuitive guidance? Some people, you're at a creative, board, you're a creative meeting with your teammates, and you get a gut hunch to, say, to, to express a creative idea that you feel inside of you, but you don't say it. What will they say? What will they say? Something as small as that, but it's not small because you're coming from your creative instincts, your creative guidance, but you don't do it. You don't speak about it. You don't say something because you think, oh, I shouldn't say that. I should. But that intuitive guidance comes from your deepest creative self, and you don't do it because of a fear of being humiliated. And that is your highest potential, your inner light talking to you. And that's the part of you that defies gravity. That's the part of you that's speaking to you from beyond your intellect, from some deep part of with you. And, w- and what I'm telling you is at that point, if I was your spiritual director, you would come home to me and you would say, I was at the meeting and I could feel myself getting this guidance and I couldn't speak about it. And I would say to you, why not? Why not? Tell me what guidance did you hear? And you would tell me that. And I would say, let's follow that through. What would it have been like for you to speak that? And you would have said, I would have felt light and I would have felt power. And now you know what it's like to defy gravity in just that minute. And for you, it would have been the most unreasonable thing to do to speak up in front of all those people. You would have defied reason and you would have felt what it's like to be filled, to defy gravity to be filled with your own light. And in that moment, you would have done more for your destiny than you would ever possibly imagine. That's what I'm talking to you about. And it would have filled you with such a sense of power. 400 personal development seminars could never do what that one experience of following that light did. Because the power that comes to you will never leave you. Are you with me now? 
Totally. That's what I'm talking about. Just like you follow it a little further, and let's talk about healing. Mm -hmm. You're in pain. You feel sick. You know you're losing power. You know it. You can feel it. You have a collision with somebody. You have a power struggle. You don't know what to do. But you feel the guidance, and the guidance says, call up and talk it through. Call them. Call them. And then your pride comes in. And your pride says, oh, no, they should call me. Uh uh. And your reason starts talking to you. And it gives you five reasons why you shouldn't call them and they should call you. So now you've got your inner light battling your reason. Mm -hmm. But your inner light is telling you the hell with your pride. Call. If you call and follow your light, your light is the path of healing. But you have to challenge your reason. But your light, the illuminated answer, is the one that heals you. It's the one that you have to defy your gravity. You have to defy reason in order to follow it and swallow, what's the expression? Swallow your pride. It's the hardest path to follow, and it's the one that always comes from your soul. So what you're essentially doing is battling ego to soul, ego to soul, ego to soul. Mm -hmm. And the more you follow that light path, based on threats of the soul and threats of hell. Mm -hmm. And so when, you know, you have people like Copernicus and Galileo, and, and it, it's really necessary to go back then because it's extraordinary to understand that who we are today actually comes from then. When people like Galileo and Copernicus, and where they realized that the earth revolved around the sun and such a simple idea today really was mind-boggling to, the, to them because they saw an order to the universe and that order became the order of God. And that gave birth to this notion that order and reason were married to each other. And look at the way we'll be given back the life we had before the catastrophe happened. And that's actually what we think. And that's applied to healing. That as soon as we figure out what the reason is, that somehow we will be given back our health, we'll be given back our marriage, we'll be given back our job. And there's no truth to this. But our therapy is based on this. Mm -hmm. And so therapy is based on finding the reason. We have to find the reason why. So we go back in this kind of search and destroy mission to, into our past. Did you find the reason yet? No, but I'll keep going back. Did you find the reason back? So that we've aimed our healing in these endless... I like to teach my students. That goes all the way back to, I think, the Renaissance, when the age of enlightenment, the age of reason, when we fell in love with the idea that we could reason with everything. We could reason with that the universe was a reasonable place, a place where uh, God was a reasonable force, where there could be a reason for everything. And that was a very delicious idea. And it challenged what was then a very superstitious universe, you know, a universe that was run by, um, uh, a superstitious so uh, church and fears that were so hello carolyn miss hello it's good to have you thank you for accepting this interview um you're definitely one of the greatest mystics of all times i believe well i don't know about that but thank you for saying that and uh, you wrote many many bestsellers including At anatomy of a spirit um, and one of the books that today we want to discuss with you is defy gravity Okay. Uh, healing beyond the bounds of reason. Yes. So, so, t so, tell us about this love affair that we have with reason. You're telling us that at some point we went out of the soul in our mind, and since then we're not fully living this um, this experience. Well, I, I think that that goes all the way back to um, as I like we talk. 
When something happens, something we don't understand, we automatically say, God must have a reason. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Right? And that comes from that. That's rooted in that. When a person develops a disease, when a catastrophe happens in your life, uh -huh. we say, I wonder what God's thinking. There must be a reason for this. Why it happened, yeah. Why it happens. And we think that it's reasonable. We think that if we could figure out the reason, there must, we talk about, there must be a lesson. Mm -hmm. As if we're in this great big huge school, mm -hmm. and if there's a lesson and we can figure that out, then somehow we're going to be rewarded, and that reward will look like this. We will